for, for the institution. Well, you all did a great job, and I appreciate the publicity, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I'd like this to be a discussion and not a lecture. So I've got a few words to say, and then we can open it up for questions. You'll be happy to know that although we have two hours, I'm not going to talk for two hours. Um, let me start by saying that uh, since publishing my novel, Bloodlines, in 2012, which I've spent about seven years writing, I've spoken at over 100 venues across the country about writing and about the novel, about the process of writing it. At none of those uh, presentations have I felt as conflicted and as bereft as I feel today because of what's happening in South Africa. Uh, there's a crisis of leadership there. Uh, President Zuma, as you may know, is uh, they're trying to impeach him. Um, and the, the, uh, th this, this, this extraordinary young democracy seems in more danger today than it has since apartheid ended and Nelson Mandela was elected in 19, uh, 1994. That's why I feel uh, uh, anxiety provoked. And I feel bereft and conflicted also because although uh, I left South Africa in, 2000, in, in 1962 at the age of 14, and although we're sitting here looking at what's happening there from one of the safest places in the world, it is still my home, even though when I go back, I recognize that the place I left doesn't exist anymore. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Let me start by reading to you a quote. The reckoning is nowhere near done. The unfinished business of colonialism and apartheid will be finished by a new generation. Anybody want to guess who said that or when it was said? Sorry? Well, I would have thought that, Martin, that, that, that Mandela or one of his colleagues said it. It was said last year by a black journalist in South Africa. And when I read it, I said to myself, how is it possible that a quarter century after apartheid ended, this kind of um, sense of unfinished business still exists? Um, and I think the answer will come out of my talk today. But the conclusion I have to reach is that oppression and servitude and inequity, like, um, like many virulent poisons, have got a much longer half-life than we would like to believe. Um, I hope by the end of this discussion to present you with, with, with some answers to that. But I'm not a journalist or a, uh, or, uh, or, or a historian. I'm a storyteller, and so I'm going to tell a story. I'm also a painter, and I hope that by the time you walk out of here, you'll have a sense uh, of, of uh, um, an impressionist painting's uh, of South Africa from the time it began until today with perhaps a clearer sense of what happened there and what's happening currently. I was born in 1948, which coincidentally is the same year that apartheid came into being. Uh, and for the first 12 years of my life, I lived in a white enclave outside Johannesburg in a suburb called Rosebank. Um, in May of 1960, something happened in South Africa that was to change forever the history of the country and, uh, the, 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 and, and its future. Uh, it was the Sharpville Massacre. And for those of you who don't know what it was, Sharpville is a village outside Johannesburg uh, where in 1960 there was a demonstration against the pass laws, the laws that mandated that black South Africans had to carry with them a document of identification at all times. Um, they were Five to 7,000 people standing around the police station uh, demonstrating against the pass law. Most of them were women and children and elderly people. Nobody knows what happened. If you read the research, somebody may have slammed a door, somebody shouted, somebody threw a rock. When the shooting was over, 70 people were dead, and most of them were women and children. And many had been women running away from the police station, shot in the back, one bullet killing a mother and child. I remember at the time that there were tanks going through the streets of Johannesburg the next day. It was the event that caused Nelson Mandela to give up on, uh, uh, on his belief in, uh, in uh, passive resistance and in, in, in peaceful change. And it marked the beginning of the creation of uh, the military wing of the African National Congress. It also marked the point at which my parents said, we're out of here. Uh, 
Um, and they said that for several reasons. One is that they had never been happy with the system of apartheid, despite the fact that they were both born there. Uh, they're both Jewish, and uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in South Africa. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was about 11, there were demonstrations at Witwatersrand University in Johannesburg um, against apartheid. And many of the ringleaders' names were Jewish. And I recall, as if it happened yesterday, hearing Prime Minister Verwurt's voice over the radio, because we had no television in 1960, uh, saying, Jewish parents, keep your children at home. That was my first, uh, um, my first uh, uh, evidence that anti-Semitism existed in the world. But my parents said, we, we, we need to get out of here. Um, so we left. My father is now 92. He was a psychiatrist for most of his life, turned into a poet when he retired. And in his 80s, he wrote a poem, which I'm going to read to you. Turns out this is a multimedia presentation. It's called The Night After Sharpville. And if you get the sense as I read it that it's filled with grief and remorse and guilt, you'd be right. One of the things that happened to many of the people who left South Africa, white people who left South Africa, in the 60s and 70s is that when they got to wherever they were going, whether it was England or the United Kingdom or Australia or New Zealand or Canada or the United States, when they finally left, they recognized how awful the system was that they had participated in. The night after Sharpville. I host a dinner party. The houseboy, white suit, red sash, brings in the silver soup tureen. My friend Jonathan says, what's on our minds? They'll take revenge. We'll all be murdered in our beds. When the guests leave, I bolt the door. See Motabi from my kitchen window sitting on the doorstep in my yard. <clears throat> he lays his sash across his knees, angles his palms like a steeple. I think we would all have done better had I given him an extra pound of tea each week. We circle around each other like planets. I never visit in the servants' rooms. But for the stranglehold of history, I might have pilfered tea leaves in twisted strips of newsprint. He might have had the manners of an upper class. We are both poured out like water. That's the recollection of an old man remembering what it was like to be a physician and a South African, a white South African under apartheid. Anyway, we arrived in Boston in November of 1962. And then uh, that started my, that started my, uh, my experience as a student in the United States. It was November when we arrived. We arrived on Thanksgiving Day at Idlewild Airport. And two weeks later, my parents sent me to school in short pants and long socks. <laughs> and the first time the teacher asked a question, instead of yelling out the answer, which is what my classmates did, I still haven't put my hand up. Uh, and so that marked the nature of my school years uh, for, 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 for a long time. I was, a, I, was a, um, I was a nerd long before it became fashionable to become a nerd. Um, one of the other things that happened to me when we arrived in South Africa was that I discovered there were two political parties here. And I couldn't for the life of me understand why America needed to have two political parties, because the only difference between political parties that I had seen in South Africa was their attitude towards race. And since there were no racial problems in America, why did we need two parties? Well, I was soon disabused of that. Um, I spent the first uh, 30 years of my adult life uh, trying as best I could to become an American and avoiding knowing anything about the place I came from. Um, I think that's common among people who leave places when they're in their early teens. You try and put roots down. It's impossible to put roots down. And so you leave your past behind you, and you just go forward. Um, went to Dartmouth in the 60s. And like many of my colleagues, I was slow to grow up. Uh, but in my mid-40s, I began to read about the place I came from. And one of the books that I read was called Ravonius Children by a man named Glenn Frankel. Uh, 
who was no relative, but who was a wonderful journalist. Um, Ravonia is the place where Lily's Leaf Farm existed, and that's where N Nelson Mandela was arrested. Uh, it's where many of the people who supported him during his, his, his struggle before he was arrested uh, lived. And the trial that took place subsequently was called the Ravonia Trial. So these are Ravonia's children. And reading this book, I discovered, as anybody who'd been reading the news previously, I discovered for the first time that when we left in 1962, there were white middle class families putting themselves on the ramparts with their black um, compatriots to fight against apartheid. And I began to wonder for the first time what my life might have been like if we had left, uh, if, if we had stayed instead of becoming, instead of, uh, I'm sorry, if we had stayed and, be and become part of that, that, that vanguard rather than leaving when we did. And I thought about that for several years, talked to my wife and children about it. Um, and then in 2005, my wife and my kids who were in their early 20s said, it's time to go back. We want to see where you come from. Well, I had no desire to go back. At some level, I was afraid of what I might find. I was uh, afraid of what uh, my reaction might be to what I found. Uh, and emotionally, it felt very tumultuous to me. But when everybody important to you in your life says, this is what we're doing, you pack your bags and you buy the tickets and you go. Before we went, however, I decided to become better informed about the place I came from. And I began reading South African history. And I'm going to give you now a very truncated version of South African history as it, um, as it applies to apartheid. If there are any real historians in here, I beg your indulgence. But I'm wanting, I want to give you a sense of how apartheid came into being. Um, there are several very important dates. The first one is 1652, which is when the Dutch East India Company arrived in South Africa to set up a refueling station at the tip of Africa for, uh, for ships going around to the, to the Indies. Um, within a couple of years, the, the, uh, the colonists of the Dutch East India Company decided that they liked the place so much they wanted to become settlers, and so they left the Dutch East India Company. Initially, the Dutch East India Company mandated that the indigenous people should not be turned into slaves. Why? I don't know. Slavery was okay. They brought slaves in from the East Indies. They brought slaves in from, from uh, India. They brought slaves from uh, Portugal. Um, they even attacked Portuguese slavers going around the tip of Africa and stole their slaves. So they were not opposed to slavery. Uh, but within 50 years of landing, the Khoikhoi, who were the original pastoral nomadic people of the, of the, of the Cape, were basically gone as a people. They'd been enslaved, their land was gone, um, and their way of life had disappeared. Uh, and more colonists came. Skip forward to 1820, when the British first arrived. And the conflict between the British and the descendants of the, of the Dutch, who became the Afrikaners, uh, began in full flower at that point because the objective of the British was to expand their empire while the objective of the Afrikaners was to establish, to create and establish and maintain a homeland for themselves. That's the sort of the basic uh, conflict between these two groups, which is instrumental in what happened later, which is why, why I bring it up. In 1834, slavery was abolished in England and the English tried very hard to abolish it in all of their colonies as well. But that ran afoul of the interests of the Afrikaners. Why? Because these edicts coming down from London said that the Boers, who became the Afrikaners, could no longer take land from the indigenous people at the indigenous people's expense. And when they abolished slavery, all the free people in the Cape uh, had the same rights under the law, which went very much against what the Afrikaners believed, which was that black Africans were heathens, that they were uncivilized, and that they were an inferior species. Um, that led to what's, what came to be called the Great Trek, where the Boers got together and they became the four trekkers, those who go before. And they left, moving up Africa and west to settle homelands for themselves. They were the members of the Dutch Reformed Church, which was complicit in apartheid to a very great degree. Um, and they believed themselves to be like the Israelites, and that their journey north and west was like the Israelites' journey um, through the desert for 40 years. They were the chosen people. Um, 
And the people that they met, the indigenous people that they met, they enslaved, they broke, and uh, they established the homeland. That's 1820. Now let's go for, forward again to 1899, when, or 1890, 1880, I'm sorry, when gold was discovered on the Witwatersrand Reef outside Johannesburg. And Johannesburg, which hadn't yet been born, within months was as big as Cape Town, which had been existing in existence for 200 years. Well, people came from all over the world to explore and to prospect for gold. And the Afrikaners were extremely concerned that pretty soon they'd be overrun by foreigners. So they established a tax on dynamite, which was rather important for blowing up the veins of gold. And there were riots, which led to the British trying to take over the gold fields, which led to the Anglo-Boer War of 1899, in which Winston Churchill was a reporter. What's interesting about that is that at the end of that war, the British established the first internment camps. And thousands of Afrikaners, men, women, and children, died of dysentery, of, um, of uh, uh, starvation, and of malnutrition in these camps, further um, breaking whatever possible relationship there was between the Afrikaans speakers and the English. So now we come to the beginning of the 20th century. You've got about 16 million people in the country. Probably 2 million are white, divided between the Afrikaans speaking and the English people, English speaking people. And the, uh, the um, black population, roughly 14 million people, are divided into at least 16 tribal groups with their own history, their own culture, their own language, and their own relationships with each other, either in amity or enmity. Um, and in many ways, apartheid was de facto already at that point. There was repression, and there was, uh, and there were, there were uh, a, a land being taken away from the Africans. Going back to 1884, there were edicts in which they were not allowed to live in cities where they had to. They were taken off their off their ancestral lands. In World War I, many of the Afrikaners, because of their antipathy to the British, wanted to go into the war on the side of Germany. And again, the British put together internment camps uh, in South Africa for potential hostile uh, um, uh, people. And an irony, one irony of history, and I'm sure there are many more, is that my grandfather left Germany at the age of 14 in about, uh, in about uh, 1908. And as a Jew, he spent the First World War in a British internment camp in South Africa because he was a German. Clearly, nobody had any sense of what was going to happen in the Second World War. But it's rather ironic that that's where he spent four years. Um, between the World Wars, things continued in the same vein. And as the rise of Nazism uh, happened in, in, in Europe, there was also a move towards that, that kind of uh, philosophy amongst the Afrikaners in South Africa. But the real importance of the Second World War in this story is that white men went to war in, in, in the Second World War, and there was a huge influx of black migrant labor into the cities without an, any infrastructure that was necessary to support them. As a result, you ended up with uh, huge increases in crime. You ended up with overpopulation. And you ended up with a new black African leadership emerging that was talking to its people about the importance of liberation. And so all the fears of the Afrikaners over the years, over the centuries, were coming to fruition. And they needed to do something, they felt, to preserve their way of life and to enshrine the superiority and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the role of the white man in South Africa. And that was apartheid. There were two political parties then, the Nationalist Party, which was on the right, and the United Party, which was a little bit to the left, but not very much. And the Nationalists began to uh, put out that the United Party was being controlled now by Western liberal interests, and that the United Party no longer had a way of keeping the, the big black population under control. And so the election of 1948 was won by the Nationalist Party, and apartheid came into being. What's interesting about it is that it was won by a minority of a minority, because those who were opposed to apartheid didn't vote because they thought the nationalists would never win. And the 80% of black population were not allowed to vote anyway. 
So you had 20% of the population voting, and a minority of those voted in this awful system of government. I'm going to read to you some of the um, some of the edicts that were passed, or the laws that were passed by, uh, by the apartheid government. And as I read the names to you, they sound so innocuous. They're just words. But they had an impact on three generations of people that was destructive uh, beyond, almost beyond description. First, there was the Population Registration Act, which required that you have to carry a a, 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 a piece of paper identifying whether you are either black, white, colored, or Indian. There were four racial classifications. And of course, it's very easy to tell whether some people are white and black, but many people, especially people of what they call colored, who are, their, who are the result of, uh, um, in South Africa, that, that category comes from people who are, uh, who have, you know, um, uh, who are the result of mixed marriages. And there are very many variations of who's white and who's black. And some people didn't fit into any of the categories very easily. So there were boards established to determine whether people were white or black or colored. Uh, and as a result, people were ripped from their homes, ripped from their families, separated because they didn't look like their parents. And then, of course, there was the pencil test. Anybody know what the pencil test is? If you put a pencil in your hair, or if the board puts a pencil in your hair and it stays there, you're black mm -hmm. because you have tight hair, curly enough to hold a pencil. Now, it sounds unreal. It actually was something that they did, and it actually was something that determined um, the, the, the tearing of families apart. The Group Areas Act just sounds like a law that was passed. It determined where people could live, black and white and colored and Indian people had to live in different areas, and you couldn't move from one to another very easily. The prevention of illegal squatting. That sounds like a reasonable thing, but what it did was to allow the government to tear down squatters camps where people lived. And they could determine what a squatters camp was, and they didn't have to provide any other uh, housing, housing for the people whose homes they took. The Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. That's pretty clear, doesn't need much explanation. Then there's the Immorality Act. That's, that, that's, that's a wonderful one because nobody wants immorality, but the Immorality Act made it a criminal offense to have sex with somebody of a different race. So what did that mean for the child born to such a union? Did it make the child a criminal? How does a child begin life with that kind of, uh, with that kind of weight on his or her shoulders? Then there were Reservation of separate amenities, separate buses, separate parks, separate benches, separate bathrooms, separate schools, uh, separate churches, um, and job reservation. Blacks were not allowed to have jobs above a certain station. And then they dismantled education, because why educate a population whose only role in life is manual labor? And lastly, the, pa the, the, uh, the uh, Black Homeland Citizenship Act. The, the whole idea behind apartheid was, as it was sold, separate but equal. So we'll take the black, uh, the black groups and put them into individual ethnic homelands, which really were not their homelands at all. They were just areas that weren't as arable as other, as other areas, and that's where they're going to live. And we will put industry on the border so that white entrepreneurs and business owners can take advantage of black labor without having to connect socially or any other way with their, black, uh, with their black neighbors. And there was apartheid. I will tell you that the real problem in South Africa, from the very practical perspective of the uh, white minority, is that word, minority. It was the black majority that made cheap African labor, made cheap black African lives, um, created a standard of life for the white population that wasn't excelled anywhere else in the world. And what brought apartheid to bear, to, to, in, into being, was their greed for the cheap labor and for the lifestyle that they had, and their fear that this huge population of uh, oppressed people would revolt. Here comes apartheid. So 
what does all this mean on a, on, 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 a, on, a, on a realistic level for the people who lived there? What did it mean for me as a little boy living in a white enclave and for the people around me? It meant that I had no idea as a young boy that just over the hill there was this massive uh, uh, population of people whose humanity was systematically being shaved from them. Um, it meant that I didn't see any black people until I came to the United States who were anything other than servants or manual laborers. It meant for our houseboy, because every white family had servants in South Africa and still do, uh, our houseboy, whose name was Maxon Maluleka, who was as old as I am today, he was a grandfather, and from whom I learned more about patience and humor than anyone else, when he had to go home to visit his family, which he did once a week, six hours one way by bus for an afternoon because he had to be back the next morning, when he needed to go and leave the house, if my parents weren't there, as a 12-year-old, I had the authority to sign his pass. Please pass Maxon Malileka from one place to another. It wasn't until I got here that I began to understand what a dehumanizing uh, life that was for him or what impact it had on us who were the beneficiaries of apartheid. So <clears throat> that's the history. Now we come to 2005 and we end up back in South Africa. And all these terrible things that I've just discussed are gone. Apartheid is no longer. We arrive in Johannesburg, I get out of the plane, and it feels to me as if I have come home. South Africa, Johannesburg is at about 5,000 feet, and around it there's, there are hundreds of thousands of miles of, uh, of high felt. And in the winter months when it's dry, these grasses catch on fire. So in order to uh, avoid the, the, these massive fires, they do controlled burns all year round. And the smell of burning grass, that particular smell, is so prevalent in Johannesburg, I didn't notice it when I was 14 when I left, but going back in my 50s, it felt as if I had come home. Uh, the optimism in the country in 2005 um, that was still there from Mandela's election in the, in the early <coughs> 90s was really palpable. You could feel it in the streets. We were going to stores and there were black and white South Africans on both sides of the counter. Uh, everybody was happy and and, and optimistic and glad to be in that place in that time. And I began to feel a terrible sense of loss about the life that I might have lived, which of course is illusion. But several things happened on that trip that um, convinced me that, uh, that uh, I wasn't through with my past, that I hadn't integrated it. One of those happened in a little town called Wilderness outside Cape Town. Were you ever there? Wilderness? Yeah. Beautiful little town. And we were in a cafe owned by a black man who wouldn't have been allowed to work there, let alone own the place when I left. And he heard us talking, and my accent came back very strongly the minute I arrived. My children said, Dad, we can't understand what you're saying. Would you please speak more clearly? Anyway, he heard my accent, picked me up by the elbow, took me outside into the sidewalk, and he said, hey, what's your story? And I found myself telling my life story to this man I had never met before. And when I was through, he said, you know, when things got really bad here, I left South Africa. I went to Europe. I married. I had three children. And then when Nelson Mandela was elected, I came back. Do you know why I came back, he said? I said, I have no idea. He said, because once you get Africa in your blood, you can never get it out. And then he threw his arms around me, and he said, welcome home, brother. And I started to cry. Nobody was more surprised at my tears than I was because I thought I was done with this. Clearly, I wasn't. The second thing that happened is that we went to the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, which is a museum intended to duplicate the experience of what it must have been like to live in a society where, where one's life is regulated based upon the color of your skin. And when you arrive, you get a chit which tells you that you're either black or white, and you go through the door that is appropriate to your particular race. And as we stood in line waiting to go in, up on the right-hand side, there was a group of 10 or 15 students, black, white, Indian, colored. And they were standing around, they were about 14 or 15 years old, standing around uh, an object and laughing. And I couldn't see what it was they were laughing at. 
until I got closer, and between their legs, I saw that it was a dark green piece of wood. And it seemed very familiar to me. And when I came closer, I saw that it was a bench. And on the bench were written the words, whites only. And they were laughing at it. And my first response was, what a wonderful thing that these kids can laugh at this object that had such implications for their parents' lives. And my second response was, if they're laughing at it, can they have any understanding at all of what actually transpired under apartheid? And so I had a thunderbolt. I said, I have to write a book. Not the book I had thought about writing, which was a book about my, my life. Nobody's interested in the life of a, of, a, of a privileged white boy who left at the age of 14. What I wanted to write was a story that everybody could read and understand and take from what it must have been like for blacks and whites alike to live under that system. And so we began the process of doing research, which took us in a lot of different places. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a few of them. It took us to a psychologist, a woman who was helping black South Africans get out of jail in the 80s, when they came out of jail and had no place to go. She's now working in Australia. And she said several things that really struck home. She said, you know, people who live under apartheid live in it in the same way that, way that fish live in water, completely unaware of their own environment until they're out of it. The second thing she said is that if you live in an oppressive state of any kind, you fall somewhere on a spectrum between being a perpetrator and a victim. And if you live in the place, you can never be off that spectrum. You may be able to move a little bit in one direction or another, but you are always either a beneficiary of the system or a victim of the system or a perpetrator in some form. And um, that's an extraordinarily wise statement, and it's true for all political systems, and it's true, I, I think of it whenever I read the paper about what's happening in the world anywhere. Um, we went to uh, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, which used to be called Zululand, and much of the book takes place in Zululand, um, and it has changed very little. It's a gorgeous place. The cover of my book is actually a picture of Zululand. You know, rolling hills, wide open spaces with the Drakensberg Mountains in the distance. And uh, we went to the Nakandla Forest, which is where King Kichwayo, the last Zulu king, hid for some years before he was found and killed. And Nakandla may be something that you're familiar with, uh, although you wouldn't have been up until a few months ago, because that's where President Zuma's estate is, the estate that is so much in the news today. And we stood on top of a mountain where there was a water tower, so massive I can't even describe to you, being built. Um, and the engineer said to us, look down there. That's the estate of Zuma. He's going to be the next president. This was 2005. He's not a nice man, he said. He's much more interested in his own interests than he is in the interests of the state. And you know, he said, he got water for himself and for his neighbors before anybody else did here. I didn't know who Zuma was at the time. Um, what's interesting about that is that when, um, when the South African Constitution was written, water was included in the Constitution as a right. And I had the privilege of talking to a man named Albie Sachs, uh, who, was an, uh, who was a South African anti-apartheid uh, activist um, who left South Africa uh, because he thought he was going to be killed if he stayed. He spent a lot of time in detention and in solitary confinement. Um, uh, anyway, he was, he was ultimately teaching, uh, teaching law, I believe it was in Mozambique, and the special branch in South Africa, which was the, the branch that did a lot of awful things under apartheid, uh, sent him a car bomb and blew off his arm and took out an eye. But when Nelson Mandela was elected, he invited this man, who was a brilliant constitutional scholar, to come back to the country and help write the Constitution. And when I went to see, to see him speak at the Moakley Courthouse in Boston, there were 15 judges there who'd come to listen to him talking about the writing of a constitution. Uh, it was fascinating. And what he said was, you know, a constitution comes out of the history of a place. And our constitution here came out of the belief that this is the best possible place in the world to live. 
And the objective of the Constitution is to keep government out of our pockets and out of our hair. In South Africa, it's very different. There, the Constitution comes out of 50 years of apartheid. And what they wanted to do was to incorporate into the Constitution many things that our Constitution doesn't have. They wanted to incorporate Ubuntu, the, 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 the Zulu word which means, which, which loosely translated means, I am here because you are here. We belong to each other. We are responsible for each other. And so there's something of a socialist uh, tinge to the Constitution. But they enshrined rights in the Constitution that we don't have here. The right to education, the right to health care, the right to water. Now, not all those things are happening yet in South Africa. Whether they ever will, I don't know. But as a goal, they're pretty admirable. Um, and so now we come to today. And today, or last week, the Constitutional Court of, the United of, 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 of South Africa voted that Prime Minister, that the President Zuma was in contravention of the Constitution and that the Parliament had debated and abetted him. And that proves to me that the Constitution is still a viable, strong, powerful tool in the arsenal of government in South Africa. Then the impeachment vote was taken and it failed miserably, which tells me that politics is there as it is anywhere else. So I want to move now to a book that was written recently by a woman named Feriel Hafiji. You know it? It's a book entitled, What If There Were No Whites in South Africa? And I think it's a book that needs to get a lot more attention than it's gotten. This woman is a self-identified black woman, although she looks like an Indian, um, born before apartheid, was, was ended, but her professional life has taken place in South Africa after apartheid. And she wrote the book because what she discovered in her, in her, uh, in her work and in her contact with her peers is that despite the fact that most of her colleagues are black, despite the fact that her mayor is black and her representatives are black, despite the fact that her president is black and the police force in South Africa is black, there is an obsession among middle-class, black, successful young people, the people they call today the born freeze, those born after the end of apartheid. There is a, an, an, an obsession with um, whiteness and white privilege. And so she did all kinds of focus groups in South Africa, in Johannesburg, trying to find out from people where this came from and what their senses were. And I will tell you that some of her conclusions are really scary. Um, what she found is that um, her young colleagues feel that as long as white assets are distributed amongst the black population, all the problems in the country will go away. If you look at the numbers, it's no longer true. They're also convinced that um, uh, there are more and wealthier whites in South Africa than there actually are. As a matter of fact, there are probably 50 million people in the country, of which 4.5 million are white. It's a relatively small population, small percentage. They're convinced that white business hasn't done what it should have done and what it promised to do at the end of apartheid to redress old wrongs. And they're convinced that the culture of whiteness whether it has to do with how you hold your knife and fork in a corporate business dinner, or how aggressive you can be in a meeting, aggressive and take charge in a Western sense, which are not African values, these are the things that still determine success in the, in the, in the, in the, in the business world in South Africa. Um, they're also convinced that although blacks have political power, they don't have economic power and that somehow there is something working behind the scenes to keep them under somebody's thumb. Uh, and these, the, 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 there is a difference between being middle class white in South Africa and being middle class black. Middle class whites come from privilege. They have, they have, according to the viewpoint of their black compatriots, swimming pools and cars and international vacations and cushions underneath where they are so that if they get into trouble, there's money. The blacks, on the other hand, are first-generation success stories, and they carry with them 
the obligation to their families who haven't made it out of poverty and who call upon them whenever there's a need for education or health or anything else. So they feel terribly burdened. Um, and I know from uh, my own experience that not all whites in South Africa fall into that category. As a matter of fact, by some accounts, those who were at the bottom of the economic ladder when apartheid ended have now fallen under the radar. And there are accounts of up to 400,000 people, 10% of the white population, living in squatters camps, which you never hear about. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's reported. I also know, because I've been solicited by uh, people on crowdfunding trying to make videos, movies in South Africa, of how the white population is being, and these are their words, not mine, being um, impoverished, and how there's a genocide against whites by the black population. <coughs> is it true? I, I, I don't think so. But amongst those who are at the bottom of the economic ladder, who are now disenfranchised in the same way that blacks were disenfranchised before apartheid, I'm sure that they're suffering. But those are not the people that the successful black population is comparing themselves to. It's the upper middle class, those who've been in, who, have, uh, who are still experiencing the fruits of apartheid. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of the complexity of what's happening in South Africa today. And then I'll bring it to a close and we can open it for questions. You may have heard about um, fees must fall in South Africa. Uh, it's a movement in the last few months of among, among first generation to go to college students who want the fees for university to go down. And the government has, has said on an ongoing basis, we can't afford to do that, you have to pay. So the students riot, they demonstrate, peaceful demonstrations, but the government sends out police, black police, black students, violence. White students come in solidarity with their black brothers and sisters and surround them as if to protect them, and the black police back off. So you have to ask yourself, what is the message here? Black lives matter, but white lives matter more, even to black policemen? It's a very strange result of, of, of the remnants of apartheid that was there for so long that this kind of thing can still happen. Um, I'll give you another example. There are thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of black miners suffering from silicosis in the country. And they're the ones who have been working underground, um, uh, getting ill early, uh, and not benefiting in the same way that the mine owners, who are both black and white today, have benefited. So a class action suit is brought to bring these black miners some sort of relief from their problems. And when it turns out that the team of lawyers is set up to, to, uh, to prosecute this case, they're all white. And the press gets hold of this and says to the person who, st who hired them all, why are all your attorneys white? And his answer is, and he's doing good work for these miners, and he's done good work in the past, but he's a leftover from the past. He says, the work I do there is no room for charity or compassion. I have to have on my team the wisest, brightest, most educated, brilliant people I can find. And the few of those who are black who fall into that category were not available for this case. Well, there was an uproar in the country. The Black Lawyers Association um, said this is the kind of comment that could have been attributed to Prime Minister Favort 40 years ago. And when the case actually came to trial, all 20 of the white lawyers stood up in the court and disavowed the comments of their employer. What happened subsequently, whether there were black lawyers brought in, I don't know. But it's an example of the kind of complexity and, and, and uh, mind-numbing uh, uh, happenings that take place in South Africa every day. So there seems to be a feeling amongst the current generation of young, black, educated South Africans, that the deal made by Nelson Mandela with the white minority when apartheid ended was not in their favor. 
that uh, the agreement that white assets wouldn't be taken was a bad deal, even though at the time it was the only way that peace could be achieved. I don't know whether these people, these young people, would have wanted it done differently or how they would do it differently, but they feel somehow betrayed by the people who brought them to freedom. And uh, I don't know whether the Truth and Reconciliation hearings that were so instrumental in bringing about peaceful change, whether they would have done it differently or at all had they been in, in, in that position. Let me close with a brief story. In 2008, when my wife and I were in South Africa, we happened to have the privilege of meeting a man whose name is Mangosuta Butelezi, mm -hmm. a prince of the Zulu people who for many years was the voice of reason in South Africa, and I think has been vilified lately because of his affiliation with uh, the political party he created, the Inkata Party. If there's time afterwards, and if you're interested, I'll tell you the story of how we had lunch. But in any case, we had lunch. It was like dining with royalty. It was an extraordinary experience. And I said to him, because this was now our third visit back to South Africa, and the optimism of the first visit was gone. And I said, you know, as a writer, and as a writer of fiction, I look for redemption in my stories. And as I look around South Africa today, I don't see any. Do you? And he said, no and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. And he was right. And I asked him, what's it like for a man, he was in his late 70s at the time, what's it like for you, I said, who spent your whole life trying to bring this country to peace and to, to, to equality, to be able to have to say that today? And his answer was, well, I'm a Christian, and I have to have hope. I'd like to have hope, too. But I would not willingly live today in South Africa. I think it's a dangerous place, especially if you're white. Uh, and increasingly, I find myself wondering whether, as human beings, when um, things as egregious as apartheid are visited on a people, whether it's even possible for there to be reconciliation without retribution. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. I'll be very happy to answer any questions or take any comments or objections, or anybody wants to sing a song, we can do that too. Yes, sir. You mentioned reconciliation. Can you elaborate? Do you think that was a successful venture? You mean the reconciliation, truth and reconciliation hearings? Yes. So the question is, was the truth and reconciliation hearings successful? I think at the time it was very successful. It was what allowed uh, a, a peaceful transfer of power to take place. I think several things came into that. One is that this concept of Ubuntu, that we own, we, that we are responsible for each other, is deeply rooted in the in the in, in the people of South Africa. Um, and and I've read the transcripts of the reconcili of the Truth and Reconciliation hearings and the atrocities that were committed, black on black, white on black, black, you know, whatever, um, were just extraordinary. And they were, people were given the opportunity to stand up, to say what they had done, and to be forgiven by their victims. And I think that went a long way towards, um, towards a peaceful transition. And the hope was that that was all that was needed. It turns out that, as I said at the beginning, uh, oppression has a very long half-life. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. A uh, couple of questions, but I'll just give you one now. Uh, I remember I covered the civil rights movement as a, as a journalist here, and there was a very close ties between uh, Jewish Americans and the, the black liberation movement here. Uh, and the rabbis were marching along with Dr. Dr. King and such. In South Africa, when I lived there, I found that a lot of the not Jewish, but I found that a lot of the, my Jewish friends, and my, uh, I found that they were not, they did not feel uh, as open to the black as, as American Jews did here. Uh, I'm just, I don't want to, it's hard to explain it without mischaracterizing it, but, I, but why would that have been? 
Am I wrong on this? Well, I don't think you're wrong. I think it's an extraordinarily complex question. The question is, the, the, the Jewish population in, uh, in this country seemed to be very involved in the civil rights movement, and it didn't seem to be so in South Africa when you were there in the late, 90, late 80s, early 90s. It's a very complex issue, and I'm going to give you an answer that is normally part of other speeches when I speak at synagogues, um, because this is an issue that really uh, touches me deeply as a Jew. Um, and, and I have to give you a little, a little bit of background first. <clears throat> um, many of the Jew, as I mentioned, many of the many of the Jewish names, many of the ringleaders in the in the demonstrations that I was that I knew about as a young man were Jewish. And if you look at the names of the people who were involved with Nelson Mandela, what you'll find is that many of them were Jewish. Way, more, way in excess of their, of, their, um, of their demographic. And I think that's for two reasons. One is that the, you know, Jewish religion says tikkun olam, heal the world. Um, and so those who believe in that actually, um, actually took, took, uh, took action to do so. The other thing is that many of those who came from, from Eastern Europe, many of the Jews who came from Eastern Europe, had a socialist or a communist background. And the communist, um, the communist party in South Africa was started by the Jews, as were many of the labor unions. Um, but despite the fact that many of the people who were with Nelson Mandela were Jews, the Jewish community as a whole said nothing. And I found that very distressing. And I found it especially distressing when I gave a talk at, uh, at Brandeis and uh, mentioned, as I said today, that as a little boy, I had no idea what was going, along, what going on across the hill. And a student in the class asked me, did your parents know, did the adults know what was going on across the hill? And I said, I, I think they did. But those who objected were in a minority. And if they had done anything or said anything, this wasn't a democracy. They would have lost their jobs or they would have gone to jail. They would have been beaten up. And she put, the teacher called me aside afterwards and she said, you know, that sounds to me very much like the excuse that was made in Nazi Germany when the Holocaust was going on and the Germans didn't do anything. And I realized at that point that although the two things are not completely equal, if I forgive, if I have the right to forgive anybody, if I forgive those whites who lived in South Africa and benefited from the system and didn't change it, I have to give the same right to the Germans who did nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I began to invest, and that was, for a Jew, that's a very hard thing to do. And I began to investigate further. And I met a woman in South Africa whose name, in Boston, uh, whose name is Maxine. Maxine Hart, who was a Jewish woman who tried very hard in the 80s to get the Jewish community to take a stand. And she was completely um, shoved off by the rabbinate. But when you read the history of South Africa, and you read that in the 30s, when Nazism was rampant in Germany and in, and, and in Europe, and you see that the Afrikaners were at that point beginning to say, you know something? It's time to take away Jewish citizenship from the Jews in our midst. You begin to understand the fear that sent my parents out of the country. There were never more than 120,000 Jews in South Africa in a population of four and a half, four and a half million whites. Today, there are probably 70,000 Jews. Um, so the answer to your question is that, yes, there were many Jews who were involved in, in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and if you look at those who went to jail with, uh, with Nelson Mandela, many of those were Jews. But the rabbinate refused to take a stand because from their perspective, their role was to protect their community. And standing up and standing out was a dangerous thing to do. So it was, it was a fascinating realization for me. Um, yes, sir? Are there any um, legitimate uh, opposition within the ANC or outside the ANC to Zuma and... So the question is, are there, is there a legitimate opposition to the ANC uh, 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 today? Yes, there is. Um, Julius Malema, who used to be the head of the, uh, the, the youth ANC, is now a, a, a political leader. And there are other parties in South Africa that are, that are opposition parties. Uh, but the ANC, 
is seen by many in the older generations as the party that brought them freedom. This was the party that was banned. This was the party that brought violence to the country and overturned apartheid. How could they betray it? And that really is one of the reasons why they're keeping it in place, as well as the fact that you know, many people in government in South Africa have become rich as a result of their positions. And uh, if Zuma goes down, many of them will go with him. So I, I think it will happen. I think there will be, I, my sense is there are gonna be some massive demonstrations in South Africa um, against Zuma and to force him to, to step down. Um, but the other thing to remember is that the Zulu ethnic group is the largest ethnic group in South Africa and um, that the ANC is basically a Zulu organization or, or, or was for many years. And so it's very hard for people, you know, we sit here looking at black and white. They're looking at tribal groups that have affiliations and, and relationships, which we can, can't even begin to understand today. What is yes, sir. The conflict in South Africa today? Is it just against Zuma? Is it against the ANC? Or is it on other kinds of issues? Is the conflict against Zuma or against the ANC? I think the conflict today is, well, before I uh, put this talk together, I would have said that the conflict is economic. It's no longer a race-based conflict. That the real issue is that unemployment is somewhere between 25 and 45 percent, depending upon who you talk to. And in a country with that kind of unemployment, you're going to have massive problems. Um, but I think that, you know, when the, when the ANC came into power, many of the people who had been revolutionaries in the 60s and 70s and 80s saw the gravy train come in. And they put aside their revolutionary zeal, and they became wealthy. The corruption in the country from every level of government, from top to bottom, is just complete. Um, and I think that's what the real issue is. What does the opposition really want right now? They want more schools. They want more hospitals. They want more roads. They want more houses. Um, you know, it's not as if they haven't done anything. There are 13 and a half million people in South Africa now who are fall under a social safety net that didn't exist under apartheid. They have built and given away millions upon millions of homes to people who didn't have them. But they're not building the homes fast enough. They're not educating students fast enough. They're educating teachers fast enough to cover all the teachers who are there. Um, and you know, I, I think part of what's taking place there is that there was a very idealistic um, attitude towards the change that, 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 that came in. We, talked to the South African ambassador a couple of years ago who gave a, a, a talk in which he said, you know, when, when the African National Congress and when apartheid was going on, South Africans would go north into Angola and other places and they helped us train and they, they, they gave us succor and they, 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 they gave us assistance. And now what's happening is that here we are, a free country, and they want to come across our borders to take advantage of our wealth and our peace because South Africa has open borders, and they're not, they're, they're, not, they're not controllable in any way. When the Constitution was written, they said anybody in South Africa can take advantage of medical treatment. And if you're in South Africa, whether you're legal or not, and you have children, you have to send them to school. So here you have this you know, idealistic view of the world. Whether that is a, a, an achievable goal in a country that doesn't have unlimited resources, I don't know. Um, but you know, I think part of part of this is that reality and and and, and idealism are, are are clashing in a dramatic way there. Yes. Um, you spoke a bit at, at the end about kind of the views of young South Africans at the moment. Um, I'm South African, so I relate to it somewhat. But um, when did, when did you come here? Just for school. Um, so everyone's back home, just for university. Um, well, I'm glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here because you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> no, I think you've uh, spoken accurately about a lot of the, the opinions, um, especially of young, young South Africans. And I don't think we can blame them to a large extent. Like, they feel betrayed by um, sort of the older generation, that, uh, especially young black South Africans that um, came through the end of apartheid. Um, and Again, I don't think it's unfair. I think you've seen like very slow rates of transformation in like big business, in um, sports teams, and wherever you look, there's been uh, land redistribution is another one. Um, so there has been very slow 
they've done a lot, but not enough in the view of a lot of people. So do you think there's a case? I know Tudu spoke about like this like wealth tax or white tax. Or do you think there's a case for some like greater measure of, of redistribution? The question is, do I think there's a there's a there's a place for greater measures of redistribution of white wealth? Um, you know, I, I think that if you try and do that, you end up, you, 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 you end up from a financial perspective, you end up um, forcing people to leave the country. And so the only way to prevent them from leaving the country is to do what they did under apartheid when my parents left, which was that you couldn't take more than $40,000 with you. Um, and so you, the, I, it's, I think it's hard to make a tax that isn't confiscatory. And I think a confiscatory tax would be a disaster. Um, I, I also think that if you look at what the, what the, what the assets are of the, of the white uh, uh, population, they are not as great anymore as what they were compared to, to, to black assets. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Not benefited the broad base of um, black South Africans. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, I don't know. I think if nothing's done, then more revolutionary wings like the EFF, um, under Malema, and those groups are going to uh, share more power in their ideas of nationalizing banks and mines, and these sorts of things are becoming more popular among. Well, I think the question is whether or not, uh, whether or not the, uh, there's some sort of confiscatory tax takes place, whether or not that will actually change anything. Because I think the real problem here is the corruption. And that's really what's, what has, what's taken uh, uh, hundreds of millions of rands and put them into the pockets of people rather than in the pockets of, of, of uh, in the pockets of individuals rather than distributing it and making life better for, for others. So can, let me, can I ask you a question? Yeah, so you, here you are, and thank you for being here because I think you provided perspective that otherwise we wouldn't have. Um, you're going back to South Africa after this. Uh, I plan on staying here for a few years, but eventually going back here. And what's it like for you living there today? I haven't been there for now for seven years. What's it, li what's it like as, a, as, as, a, as a, a member of a very small white minority. Where do you live? I live in Joburg, in Joburg, in Randburg, yeah. Um, yeah, Craig Hall. Um, yeah, so probably 50 minutes from where you grew up. Right. Um, sorry, so you're questioning what's it like? My question is, is what, what is it like for the average middle class white family living in Johannesburg? Um, and, you know, I hear stories about this, and I've spoken to people who've been there, more recently than I have. Um, but I imagine that there must be a sense of being beleaguered or not, of being, of being somehow imprisoned. And if there's not, I'd be, be, I'd be very interested to know what your take is on that. Um, I'm not too sure what you're getting at, but I think there is. Um... Well, let, me give you an, let me give you an example, OK? I know people who left South Africa 10 years ago went to Canada, um, and one afternoon, going for a walk, they lived in uh, Santon, going for a walk in the middle of Toronto, they were walking around with their dog, and they looked at each other, this is a couple in their 50s, and they said, we're free. And they realized that their whole lives had been spent in a country where they had to look behind them every single moment and where every door had to be locked behind them at every single moment, and they lived behind electrified walls. So my sense, my, my, they didn't know that until they left. So now you've left, so you've seen a different way of living. So my question is, when you think back about what life is like there, what is it like for you there? 
that feeling is contrasted with the kind of guilt and privilege that you feel living in the society um, that, okay, you live in fear of crime and corruption and those sort of things, but also you're incredibly privileged in a lot of other ways. And a lot of other South Africans also have to deal with these things, but they don't have the same resources that you have to do this. Um, so there's that feeling. And then secondly, I think, at least the way I see it, I don't see South Africa in the same place of hopelessness. Um, I think we've been, even post-94, um, I think we've been in similar situations. I mean, Betty got um, creamed. impeached pretty yes. much. Mm -hmm. um, we've been through huge, like, the arms gate. We've been through huge corruption scandals before. I don't think this is anything new. And I don't see the same, like, despair. I think, like, the roads must fall, fees must fall, provided some, like, optimism more than anything else, I think. A release, so, perhaps. Yeah. Rather than another kind of fair springer. Well, thank you. That's 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 actually very useful. Does anybody want to ask this young man any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, curious about the. Uh, I mean, the way that we typically think about these things in North America. Uh, and coming from the bias of being a journalist, as Chris is, I've always had the impression was that these kinds of things, where you have a relatively open society, one of the first starting points for this is exposure. And exposure through a reasonably free medium. And that if you had that capacity to bring truth to power, that over time could have a beneficial effect in a society that's trying to make a decision about where the limited resources should be used. I happen to think that you are correct, that corruption has to be number one on the agenda. But you're not going to deal with corruption unless you have exposure, full exposure of who's getting it and where's it coming from, so that at some point appropriate action or counteraction can be taken. So I guess my question to both of you, is there a capacity in that society, as I thought there used to be with the Rand Daily Mail under Boji, uh, Benji Pogrom and people like that, to do precisely that in South Africa today? Do you see that? I think there's a free press, but I've also seen attempts to muffle the press. Um, uh, almost forgetting that, that, that a free press is government attempts to, muff, to muffle the press because they see, seem to forget sometimes that opposition to government is what enabled them to get there in the first place. You know, I, I, think, the, I think the institutions are still free. I hope they remain free. Whether they will depends upon whether or not this massive, this massive underclass is willing to wait long enough for the things that they've been promised, um, and whether they can uh, increase education quickly enough to get people to understand what's going on. Yes, sir. Uh, I only have a month that I just spent in Cape Town as evidence and a couple of months before that. But I will say that reading papers every day uh, in South Africa, they are outspoken as anything against so they are raising hell about what the Guptas have done, mm -hmm. the offers made to the deputy finance minister, uh, the takeover, the, the pending arms deal. So I see that as a real ray of hope. I also see a ray of hope in that the public protector and then the South African Supreme Court has condemned uh, Zulu's actions as spending of, uh, state money on improvements at encampment. Uh, I think the question now is how these different forces come together, whether the ANC continues to stick with Zuma, uh, or whether there will be a breaking up of the ANC or some other realignment. So I'm, uh, I was tremendously pessimistic when I read this book uh, 
how long will South Africa survive by uh, Johnson? Because mm -hmm. he just documents the corruption up and down. On the other hand, he gives no credence to the harm and the legacy of apartheid, and that there's a real case for huge efforts to make up for some of that. Uh, so I, I, I think it's like the games in play now, and it's really hard to tell what's going to happen. Uh, I think that what's important along with the free press and free media is the ability of the South African people to hold the leaders accountable. And when you've got the ANC winning 65% of the vote, it's very hard to hold these people accountable. Um, I don't know. I think that will come. I think the emergence of like a strong EFF is good for a South African democracy. Mm -hmm. um, as radical as they may be, it, it helps. I think it helps people to hold these leaders more in account. I also think that in a uh, globalized world that we have, that the uh, growing influence of uh, the kind of exposure that um, the Panama Papers has provided and that social media has the capacity to provide brings a, a different kind of spotlight on places like uh, South Africa, uh, above and beyond the local press. And that, over time, I think can have a beneficial effect, because South Africa is also part economically and financially of, of the global system. And at some point, uh, they have got to get their act together. And oh, yeah. I, or there's going to be consequences. And, you know, like we've seen in Nigeria, where uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine who went back at, after the World Bank to be the Minister of Finance, she was able, through a lot of exposure, to get uh, the Swiss to reveal the bank accounts of the corrupt Nigerian officials who have been storing away multi-billions of dollars. And she got back something on the order of over a billion dollars back in, in the, country. the coffers that were used to strengthen the budget and do some useful things in Nigeria through exposure, through going after the culprit. So there is hope. But it takes courageous people. It takes very courageous people. Yeah. And it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. Um, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.